have the Q&A. Hello, SBA. Hello. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Welcome. Same here. Have the Q&A. Hello, SBA. Okay, so um, um, welcome to Kaderas University Lecture Series. Today, uh, we are joined by Georg Hartonian uh, from uh, University of Canberra. Uh, and he's going to be uh, giving a lecture uh, titled Mise contre le Corbusier, uh, Diachronic Temporality. And I'll do a short introduction on our guest. Uh, he's a professor emeritus of architectural history at the University of Canberra, Australia. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, United States. Uh, he has taught in American universities, including Pratt Institute and Columbia University. And he has been a visiting professor of architectural history at Tongji University, Shanghai. Hartunian is most recently the author of Reading Kenneth Frampton, a contemporary on modern architecture uh, and time, history and architecture essays on critical historiography. His previous publications include among others, Architecture and Spectacle, A Critique, The Mental Life of the Architectural Historian uh, and Ontology of Construction. And his forthcoming books include Towards a Critique of Architecture's uh, Contemporaneity uh, for Essays and The Visibility of Modernization in Architecture, a Debate. So uh, without further ado, I would like to um, uh, leave the floor to Professor Hartunian, and we have been looking for this uh, lecture. And uh, for our students who have joined us uh, after the lecture, uh, we will have a chance to direct your questions to uh, our guests. So if you have any questions, you can leave um, your questions as comments to our um, live uh, streaming on our YouTube channel. Um, so, um, Professor Hartonian, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Sabri Cook, and, uh, and uh, I appreciate to have this opportunity to share my thoughts on historiography of architecture with academics and students of architecture. And there are some invisible audience, I guess, as well. So let me upload to share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, okay, I guess everybody will see this. Speaking of uh, technology and temporality, uh, I'm reminded of uh, Mario Corpus' uh, book, Second Digital Term, published in 2017, where he correctly observes that most architects tend to resist accepting technological change. However, turning his focus to digital techniques, he dismisses the idea that the transformation from mechanical to digital reproducibility, to use Mottler Benjamin's uh, terminologies uh, in architecture is informed by the dialectics of the technical and ideological. Uh, my criticism uh, involves turning in uh, technical development uh, usually ensures the formation of related subjectivity, which uh, to be internalized uh, across the everyday life of uh, capitalism. For example, uh, in 19th century, the transformation to mechanical reproducibility uh, replaced the masonry construction system with that of the frame construction system aided by the availability of materials such as steel, glass, and concrete. The aesthetic and spatial aspects of that transformation uh, is discussed uh, by Gideon, and we will see it shortly. However, like Carpool today, Gideon also failed to identify the zeitgeist 
as the ideology of an emerging bourgeoisie that would hold on the Promethean faith in technological uh, progress. Now, in this uh, uh, reversal of transformation, two things happen. One, through 3D printing, the gap between design and building is eliminated in favor of an artisanal state of making, wherein the architect's authority is mediated not through drawing, but through direct control of the process of construction in collaboration with other involved agencies. Two, to overcome its current limitation, which is reproduction of small or fabrication of small objects, digital fabrication is expected to bridge the gap between design and production. With these introductory remarks, I claim that criticism of contemporary architecture should focus on the historicity of the tectonics of skin and frame. And since Le Corbusier's formulation of the domino uh, frame, the, the issue uh, of the surface has become important as a measure to differentiate the work of architects from uh, in engineering, but also to avoid uh, Gothic's emphasis on the vertical presence uh, or expression of construction in the surface of the uh, buildings. Now, in this lecture, the, uh, I want to focus on these four projects uh, by Le Corbusier and uh, Mies. Uh, of course, uh, everybody is familiar with Corb's Villa Soa from 1929, which I will discuss that uh, versus Mises' concrete, uh, sorry, Mises' uh, uh, Fransworth House, which was designed in 1950s to highlight this issue of the different approaches to temporality, but also the frame. Uh, in these two architects' work. And then I would like to focus on Mises Concrete Country House in 1923, uh, along with Le Corbusier's Maison Jaune in 1952, to show a turnaway in both architects uh, from lightness and frame structure to more uh, heavy or masonry construction. Uh, system, but uh, uh, as it happens in two different uh, period of uh, history. Uh, so my, uh, in a way, uh, I want to criticize the historiographies that they look at the zeitgeist of temporality as a uh, homogeneous entity. And I want to introduce this notion of the uh, uh, diachronicism uh, to offer a different view of the history of uh, uh, architecture, but also how to it is effective for criticism of the contemporary architecture. At the heart of this issue for me is the notion of technology uh, and time and history and architecture that I have discussed in my <coughs> in my book and. Gideon was one of the first historians to highlight the zeitgeist uh, or temporality as a unifying cultural uh, principles. But my own uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, inclination or take on these subjects comes from uh, thinkers like Walter Benjamin, Martin Heidegger, Theodore Adorno, uh, to highlight this uh, issue of the perception in technological developments. And as technology develops uh, and we experience today very clearly, uh, there's an acceleration, it changes to the point that uh, what is new uh, in next day becomes uh, kind of outdated. And this acceleration, is basically discussed in Jonathan Crary's book, 
25 times 7. Uh, and all of us who deal today with uh, uh, mobile, we are quite addicted to this acceleration and how this has changed our perception and to some extent architecture. But so, uh, another hero here is, of course, Theodor Adorno, who uh, introduced this notion of technification of art. Uh, of course, he started this discussion in his criticism uh, of uh, uh, music, especially jazz music, where through uh, technical devices, the, the musician or the instrument uh, loses its, so to speak, natural sound and uh, uh, and uh, uh, that technification electrific electrifying the sound it becomes a different ambience and we it also creates its own subjectivity to critique uh, uh, these views then I like to bring to your attention Ernest Bloch uh, the German thinker who in 1930s, uh, published this book called Heritage of Our Time. Uh, and in that, uh, he introduced this notion of non-simultaneity of the experience of time. And he says, I read for you, not all people exist in the same now. They do not externally by virtue of the fact that they may all be seen today, but that doesn't mean that they are living at the same time with others. So if you recall my previous uh, image, uh, then you can see that uh, uh, to these two architects, uh, Le Corbusier and uh, uh, Miss, they approach to the issue of that, uh, for example, Frank in totally different uh, time, although they were both as a, as a giants of modern movement uh, architecture. Now, this uh, notion of the technification and the subjectivity it creates uh, brings to our attention this dichotomy or the, the relationship between spectacle uh, and the spectator. Uh, and this idea of the spectacle and spectator comes to us from Walter Benjamin's great book, Arcade's Project, uh, where he discusses the novelty of the Crystal Palace designed by John Paxton in 1851, and where uh, the new experience of the objects, for the first time, objects of old and new were put together uh, and it was uh, kind of cruel, suggestive that the spectacle as such should be internalized by the uh, spectator. And it has happened as such today to the point that uh, our expression of what is what we like, uh, uh, we just said it's cool. And we never define what do we mean by cool, but it has become our kind of uh, subjective ideological uh, engagement with spectacle that also uh, uh, today is a kind of uh, experience to parametric uh, architecture. Now, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, wrote in Arcade's project that world exhibition glorify the exchange value of the commodity. They create a framework in which its use value recedes into the background. They open a phantasmagoria which a person enters to be distracted. The entertainment industry makes this easier by elevating the person to the commodity level. He surrenders to its manipulations while enjoying his alienation from himself and others. In the book, Walter Benjamin uh, recalls Gottfried Semper, who we see here his design for Canadian uh, section in the 
uh, Crystal Palace uh, and where uh, highlights Gottfried Semper's remark on gas lighting, as we see at the top of image. Uh, the German architect wrote, quote, what a splendid invention this gas lighting is. In how many different ways has it not enriched the festive occasion of life, not to mention its infinite importance for our practical uh, needs. So here, imply uh, we can take in recollection of Gottfried Semper's uh, concern about tectonics, the construction and its architectonic uh, expression uh, that in modernity, the uh, architecture rapport with history is centered on the agency of the uh, frame. Uh, without uh, reflecting on this, I would go further and suggest that uh, the differences of 1920s interest in the international, uh, in politics and architecture uh, is today differentiated from uh, globalization uh, that used the political regime of uh, modernism. As I was saying, Gideon was the first historian in his uh, magnificent book, Building in France, Building in Iron, Building in uh, Ferro Concrete in 1928. He uh, demonstrated these very beautiful pictures uh, to introduce the new sense of space and perception of uh, subjectivity. Uh, Walter Benjamin was very fascinated with this book, particularly with uh, Gideon's uh, notion that uh, the construction was the unconscious of the 19th uh, century. Uh, and of course, if you look at 19th century debates in architecture, everybody was concerned with the issue of the style, in what style should they build uh, in consider consideration that uh, construction had become the subconscious of the time. But what is interesting is that Benjamin gives a turn, a twist, uh, this notion of Gideon introducing uh, the idea of uh, a dream image that is associated with uh, uh, technology. Uh, and to do that, he introduces the physiological element, the act of making, and which creates uh, uh, that uh, phantasmagoria and the, the dream image, uh, which for him is the positive aspect of technological uh, development. And here, just in again passing, that's where Benjamin differs from Theodore Adorno, who emphasized on the negative aspect of technology. But for Walter Benjamin, it was important to highlight also the dream image, which later on he expands on this in his vision of history and historiography, which I personally have benefited uh, amazingly. And in his book on short history of photography, published in 1931, he introduces this idea of optical unconscious that new technologies uh, create an uh, optical unconscious that undermines the symbolic dimension uh, of erotic aspects or pre-modern uh, state of uh, objectivity. Uh, Benjamin also in his arcade project again, he recalls Karl Bottice, a German a historian and architect who for the first time uh, make it, made a distinction between current form and Kunst form, art form and construction form, which uh, Samper borrowed and uh, kind of uh, uh, articulated his own tectonic. But Karl Bottich is interesting because he said that uh, we have exhausted the tectonics of stone architecture and the new architecture uh, will 
been born out of the uh, iron uh, in analogy to the work of engineering, uh, or he proposed architecture as engineering. Here, just I want to ahead to say that this notion of uh, architecture as engineering is in fact one of the uh, diachronic approaches between Mies and local Rousier to technology. Both these architects were fascinated with modern technology, but they uh, approach this in a very uh, different uh, way. That uh, uh, then, uh, in that regard, uh, the, if we want to briefly uh, define the tectonics, uh, is under mediated material and structural self expression and the interpretive uh, representation through ornament as mutually mediated and hence invisible. So in Botticher's uh, relationship of Kunstwerk and Kunstwerk, this relation is invisible. And what is uh, interesting to us is happening that through digital reproducibility and especially uh, parametrics dominant in the Hadith's architecture today, that invisibility has become a visible phenomenon as part of commodity fetishism and spectacle of uh, capitalist state of production and uh, consumption. Now, all these things uh, to me uh, happens and takes place in 1925 in Mrs. Barcelona uh, Pavilion uh, as a, a tectonic uh, par excellence uh, architecture, and it shows Mrs. Uh, very different take on uh, frame uh, and uh, materiality. And we see here uh, the relationship between inside outside uh, is. Uh, touched or uh, perceived in the colorful marbles, uh, the metallic uh, uh, color, but also the glass uh, itself. Now, speaking of interiority, then here we have uh, an uh, Le Corbusier in collaboration with Charlotte uh, Perriand, the uh, interior space, and you, you, you see here that everything are homogeneously perceived in terms of the modern uh, vision and uh, visuality. Whereas if you introduce uh, Adolf Loos's Moller House, which is also designed and built in 1928, we can see uh, that Adolf Loos here uh, was introducing uh, uh, non-simultaneous uh, experience of interior space, which is uh, uh, influenced by the uh, stone, uh, carpet, uh, and chairs that are designed at the time. But as we see, they are very different than uh, the design of the uh, Perion and even Le Corbusier. Now, to start uh, my uh, focus, I want to first start on these two uh, buildings designed in two different types, but they basically present uh, their own interpretation of frame uh, structure. And these uh, two architects, as you see in uh, Deutsche Werkbank exhibition in 1920s, Seven, they agree at least on one thing, on fashion. Both of them are dressed up fashionably as a gentleman of the early 20th century. Uh, but when it comes to uh, technology, uh, they have different takes. Uh, and I want to explore that differences in uh, next uh, in images. But before that, this issue of the uh, the double function of the uh, frame in uh, in architecture. Uh, on the one hand, 
it deconstructs the masonry construction system, but at the same time, uh, uh, it aligns the production activity of architecture with a broader uh, production and consumption of capitalist system to the point that today there's an industry of uh, construction system that architects are not involved uh, uh, at all. Uh, and the other thing uh, I want to suggest this uh, idea of uh, that this uh, two uh, dual double function that I introduced, uh, what does it mean for architecture is that in addition to the prevailing general network of technical means and intellectual labor that glues architecture more than any other work of art to the present production and consumption system. Uh, therefore, the challenge uh, I suggest facing criticism and historiography is the recovery, to paraphrase Manfredo Tafuri, as far as possible, of the original functions and ideologies that in the course of time define and delimit the role and meaning of architecture. So implied in this, what I like is, in a way, uh, there is a sense of resistance in Tafuri's uh, statement, uh, which also we can see in uh, reading uh, Kenneth Frampton's historiography, especially his uh, fifth edition uh, to critical history. Now, the other uh, notion uh, is uh, I like to uh, periodize the history, entire history of architecture tectonically. Uh, so therefore I propose we have two periods. One is the classical period, and then we have a uh, modern uh, period. Uh, this tectonic periodization is important because it settles the differences between the modern and classical in particular terms, particular in that it rejects the distinction between art and non-artistic or historical uh, Pretext. And uh, then this issue of non simultaneity of frame, materiality, and nature, and monumentality. These are the three areas that uh, I, I will touch uh, through this uh, to show the diachronic, uh, diachronicism between these two architecture as far as it concerns frame, materiality, nature, and uh, monumentality. Now, I, I like to start with uh, Villa Sawa, uh, discussed in every book written on the history of architecture. And of course, uh, the highlight of uh, the project is the domino frame, which has uh, three slabs, one stair, and six uh, columns. And one of the amazing uh, discussion of this object is uh, comes to us uh, by uh, Peter Eisman, very beautifully articulates this as a uh, uh, modern uh, cultural object uh, that defines architecture. And I would suggest that uh, it is the subconscious of architecture, even in parametrics. Any architecture today, if we clean up all the covers, there is a frame structure, whether directly or indirectly associated with, with the domino frame, which uh, Lokobuzia articulates its implication for architecture in uh, five points of architecture in his, uh, uh, in his uh, book towards a new architecture. One of the things I want to highlight is upon my visit, I was fascinated with this open space. Uh, whereas when you are in this interior uh, main space of the house, uh, the main focus is this uh, uh, courtyard, so to speak, uh, which is, uh, I was shocked to see this and think about how mistaken were Colin Rowe and others who presented a formalistic approach to 
look of Vizier's form. And uh, related to this, uh, as we will see shortly in the sections, but I have to mention here uh, the metric system involved in the location of the columns. As you see here, the columns are being pushed away from the of the uh, slab, but in two different ways. As you see here, uh, these ones are deeper here, are uh, little pushed away, which of course allows to uh, cover the whole uh, structure by uh, free surface or free uh, facade. But that directionality, uh, as we see like that here is implied with this uh, uh, location of the ramp. And uh, we can see here that directionality in local Buzia's magnificent uh, project, urban project plan of Buz for Algiers in 1933. And we see here that the slabs goes and the columns are pushed behind, but of course, offering also the plates uh, or slabs that each person can uh, build his or her own house uh, differently as implied here. But Le Corbusier's uh, five point tries to deconstruct the uh, uh, Palladian and Alberti's villas. Uh, as we saw, there is no symmetrical composition as it is here, but also I'm always fascinated with this Sorry, with this uh, section, as you see, the ramp erodes the center of the uh, house, contrary to the section in Villa Rotonda, which is covered and maintains that symmetrical uh, composition. Whereas uh, here uh, in Local Vizier, neither of them exists as such. Now, every time we can, uh, we should go back to this and then start with the uh, frame issue in, in uh, Mrs. Uh, Farnsworth uh, house, which is basically two horizontal slabs, eight steel columns that are uh, plug welded to the uh, beams above. These connections, uh, uh, writes uh, uh, Michael Caldwell, require a sequence of operations that demands a high degree of craft, yet each operation disappears with the next. In the sequential move from mechanical uh, craft to industrial and then to handcraft, Codwell continues, there is no glorification of technology as there is no uh, remnant of the craft. Uh, this is uh, indeed a significant observation because it brings this notion of the uh, embellishment uh, that uh, Caldwell reminds us that uh, Miss ordered eight times uh, to be painted these columns and beams. So it attains that visuality that he was expecting to receive. And here, of course, in passing, uh, this is the big differences between Miss's approach to the frame from even people like uh, Roger Piano, uh, especially in Center Pompidou, which Frampton has correctly called product for rather than uh, tectonic, and as uh, you see in uh, Mises' architecture. And then if you compare quickly the plan of Francois House with uh, uh, Le Corbusier Villa Sawa, we can see how different uh, these two uh, plans are, even though both of them are the, somehow have in, uh, trying to uh, kind of uh, register the notion of uh, open plan. But in uh, Miss, it's the idea of Rome uh, as a basics of architecture from classical that it tries to maintain uh, in this uh, project. Uh, another difference relates to the notion of free facade. Uh, in both cases, the element of the facade is free and plays no role in carrying the load 
load of a building. However, in Villa Sawa, the facade provides the opportunity to insert horizontal cuts into the surface of the building, whereas in Miss, uh, the location of the mullions of the glass facade is decided based on the distance separating the columns uh, from uh, each other uh, and therefore avoiding any mullions uh, in the uh, in his uh, in his uh, uh, architecture. Now, if you look at bringing that notion of the nature uh, and the dichotomy here, uh, this is on the right hand. We have a view of the from uh, inside the main living room of Villa Sawa, looking at the courtyard as the heart of it. And the courtyard, of course, is a typology coming from vernacular architecture. And we all know how was uh, Le Corbusier in, in, in France in his uh, journey into the East, especially he came also to Turkey to emulate this uh, vernacular aspects of architecture, whereas in, in Mrs. Uh, France, uh, France work house, uh, we can see uh, the nature kept in distance and there is no access to it directly. Here, uh, of course, uh, uh, Miss in an interview said that uh, you, you won't experience the colorfulness of uh, nature if you don't live in a uh, uh, glass house. Uh, but of course, he was following the tradition of the uh, Dada, Dadaists in Berlin uh, that they tried to keep uh, nature in distance. Uh, even in his uh, Tugenda house, when the glass can be moved and goes into the basement, you can't walk into the garden. So there is always this distance between nature uh, as an out outdoor, but also the uh, inside as such. You should also quickly look at the context, uh, the way the, the Villa Sawa, uh, France World House, but also Palladio, uh, which in Palladio we can see this function of frontality, the way uh, someone uh, approaches to the main entrance, but in Le Corbusier, that is reversed by the way cars approach and park, and then you go up vertically, whereas uh, none of them is uh, kind of uh, suggestive in uh, Mises' uh, work uh, where you enter to a platform and then uh, rise up again and enter to the main uh, living room. To further uh, highlight this, uh, nature in these two architects, I like to quickly share with you their early houses. Mrs. Uh, uh, Real House in 1911 on the left side and Corbe's Villa du Fond in 1912. What is interesting that there is a wall kind of facing to the garden, uh, but in uh, Miss, uh, there is a perforations that from main. Uh, uh, entry court of the house, you can enter to the garden, but also the differences in the way, in the, way the wall ends to the roof. In uh, Le Corbusier, he almost follows early uh, houses of Frank Lloyd Wright, that uh, roof has been emphasized by continuous fenestration, whereas in Miss, we have this classical notion of the gable projecting itself over the uh, uh, garden. And if you look at their planimetric organization, we see that in Miss we enter from here and then we have to go that direction to enter to the main uh, living space. Whereas in Miss you perpendicular, almost classical, you enter to it. But nevertheless, I wanna bring your attention to this little balcony, which becomes one of the architectonics of radical modernism. And here we see in Mahali Narges, Bajos uh, balconies projecting out of the uh, uh, main facade of the uh, building. And here 
uh, implied and suggesting is that uh, Walter Benjamin's optical unconscious introduced by uh, by the camera image. Now we should look at the, uh, this uh, issue of uh, the chronic temporalities between these two buildings. Uh, one, uh, as we will see in Le Corbusier, uh, as on Jaul, emulates vernacular issues, uh, whereas, uh, uh, sorry, the spelling, uh, whereas in uh, Le Corbusier's uh, uh, concrete uh, house, it goes back to constructivism, particularly uh, the way uh, it dynamics of its composition, uh, but also the way he treats uh, uh, the material of the concrete uh, as a uh, almost plastic. And we can see that in the cuts he introduces here to highlight the entry to main entry to the building, but that kind of the construction of the classical or traditional expectation of architectural form, you can see here the cuts of the window that goes, crosses the uh, corner to the point that the upper floor looks lifted up and uh, uh, on its own uh, as perceptually uh, at least. This notion of the uh, experimentation of material with material uh, similar to the concrete uh, uh, house uh, we can explore in uh, briefly in Brick Country House in 1923, where the wall, brick wall, continues beyond uh, the location of the roof, which uh, enters. What happened? which, uh, sorry for that, which happened, uh, but also beyond the uh, needs of enclosing interior space. And we see here that the plan is uh, quite an open plan, but beyond what uh, uh, we see in local Rousia and even in Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. This experimentation with material, he extends here in a brick house, uh, Esther and Long house, in 1927, uh, we see that the brick, the window openings are quite unusually larger than uh, we expect from a masonry uh, wall. Uh, and also what I wanna bring to your attention here is this uh, main brick wall, which separates the garden side uh, from the, or crochet, the car entering here. And this is, very to me interesting subject because he, but also uh, uh, Lucor Uzier, both uh, at the same time, they give attention to this new phenomena of uh, arriving home by car here in Villa Schwab in 1960, here the porcochet that drops the person uh, and then uh, because it faced to the city, then we have this uh, white uh, uh, faceless uh, surface. And then we have the same kind of articulation here, this extensive emphasis on verticality and horizontality of wall to define the uh, porcoche uh, as such. Now to move to uh, Maison uh, Jaul, uh, what is, Interesting here, this is of course uh, two houses, perhaps father and son apparently. Uh, and uh, we see uh, here that the car goes underground and the buildings are setting above the uh, garage. And uh, two things is important to me. Notice as far as this notion of the uh, vernacular is, uh, one is that the brick is not uh, clearly art articulated. Uh, uh, second is 
on that, uh, uh, contrary to that, uh, he is using a very highly developed stru concrete structural system uh, with arches uh, as it goes along the, uh, uh, the length of the building. But then uh, also there is this issue of the corner articulation, which combines metal, uh, wood, and steel, uh, plywood, and uh, steel together, uh, which is, uh, again, we can see the corner articulation in Mises chemistry building in Chicago, and this idea of vertical uh, openings, which uh, he had huge, Le Corbusier's huge argument with August Pereira, the other French architect who was uh, suggestive of the uh, vertical uh, uh, fenestration, and Le Corbusier was arguing for horizontal at the time of his design for Villa Sauvage. So, well, but here we see he going back to that mainly because of the nature of uh, references to vernacular architecture or the way vernacular architecture uses brick uh, supportive wall. But then there is this L-shaped windows here that we can see also in L-shaped windows in Sterling's uh, uh, Ham Common House in 1955, which both of them come from uh, at least in Sterling's building from industrial buildings of, uh, uh, of uh, England. And then this notion of the use of Catalan tiles, which according to Frampton, uh, an affront to those architects who had been nurtured on the myth that modern architecture was necessarily machinistic, and planner and above all sustained by an elegant and articulated structural uh, frame uh, by Le Corbusier. But interestingly, uh, Franco uh, is a little bit critical of those uh, uh, vertical, uh, vertical windows. It was almost windows almost saying that it's kind of a, a claustrophobic uh, from the inside uh, as such, which is part of the, again, going back to vernacular uh, architecture. Now, three points maybe we can uh, conclude this, that the tendency to mix industrial technology with pre-industrial buildings techniques uh, advanced engineering techniques are evident, as I said, in the construction module of the concrete walls uh, and an aesthetic shift from platonic geometry to the uh, tectonic uh, as such, uh, which again, uh, and this is where Frampton's uh, is sympathetic to the world because there is a resistance to total technification of architecture, but complete industrial means, which I think that resistance also uh, we can see in Mises' later work, particularly the way he articulates uh, the tectonic of column and beam and wall, which goes back to Hellenic uh, architecture rather than uh, the uh, vernacular architecture. And to highlight that, I like to share with you uh, the two, the last uh, work of these two architects and on this notion of monumentality, which uh, we owe to Kenneth Frampton again, uh, Le Corbusier's uh, uh, famous church in France uh, and Mises' uh, National Gallery of uh, Berlin. Uh, and the differences is very interesting. Both of them, of course, use the latest uh, construction technique, either on uh, concrete or uh, glass. Uh, but the differences is their referentiality. As I said uh, in 
the Corbusier uh, the form and particular ornamental elements. It uh, uh, draws from vernacular, uh, whereas in Miss it uh, bring, goes back to the uh, Hellenic architecture, the uh, architectonic of column, uh, roof, and enclosure. And then when we look at their plan, we can see again in Le Corbusier the complexity of the plan always and the importance of circulation versus in Miss the simplicity and this notion of the uh, uh, simple uh, room uh, as such. Now, the, in this uh, diachronic uh, observation, I want to make uh, two uh, conclusions to my lecture. Uh, the first one is, uh, if we agree with the proposition that the 19th century obsessed, uh, was obsessed uh, with the notion of style, and particularly what to do with steel and glass. Mrs. Uh, uh, National Gallery and his work in uh, America uh, resolved that issue and therefore architects had no other choice what to do uh, with it. And therefore that turned to, uh, to postmodernism uh, or formalism via Peter Eisman. Uh, or uh, after 90, parametric design, thanks to uh, digitalization of uh, uh, architecture. Now, what is, uh, and here we see there are differences also in the section. Uh, in this, what is important in section, which is, uh, this is a kind of very minimal section drawing, is that the upper floor, very abstract, tectonic, relates to the notion of Berlin as an urban, uh, uh, which where relationship is based on exchange value and abstraction, whereas the lower level where uh, staff are, then it faces the garden as usual, which is very important for Miss, but always indirectly and uh, not directly. Whereas uh, in uh, Miss, uh, it's almost an object uh, free, uh, sitting in the landscape, perhaps as a vernacular abode somewhere uh, uh, in analogy, of course. Now, the differences also in, ter in terms of the uh, roof, uh, I want to bring your attention the interior space of the uh, Rang Champ, uh, which we see the uh, roof bows almost like a tabernacle in reference to Jewish tradition of a religious space, whereas in this uh, we have total abstraction uh, and objectivity that is based on this uh, regular repetitive uh, square shapes, uh, which Kenneth Ranton has uh, discussed in terms of L.D. uh white and white, uh, painting, abstract painting, uh, but also I want to suggest uh, how uh, is uh, tectonic articulation, it goes beyond the, uh, what was suggested uh, in the uh, cover page of the uh, Logier uh, essay on architecture, and it uh, becomes uh, a very uh, uh, modern articulation of this uh, uh, tectonic issue. But also, uh, I want to highlight this fact. It goes also beyond the Hellenic notion of the tectonic, which uh, with a reversal. What we see here is that it, we have the perception or the uh, thing object looks that it is supported by those columns at the corner. And uh, whereas we know actually that stone uh, wall is supporting the whole thing. And here missing Berlin reverses that illusion. Uh, the columns become supportive element and then the glass becomes an enclosure push inside uh, uh, away from uh, column, which also is not subject to cladding uh, as such. Now, this, uh, here, uh, I want to 
kind of uh, talk about this uh, notion of the skeleton uh, very uh, quickly uh, in uh, in Mrs. Uh, architecture, but also the notion of skeleton and repetition in uh, Madonna, uh, Madonna, uh, uh, Madonna uh, cemetery by Aldo Rossi and also Peter Eisman's uh, memorial for Jewish massacre in uh, Berlin. Uh, so this uh, skeleton uh, becomes uh, uh, quite interesting phenomenon when we look at these three interesting works from three different architecture. But what is important again uh, in MIS is this notion of the detailing. And here we see the connection between the beam and column and an abstract diagram of the project. And what this says, it gives you an idea of the labor involved in making this connection. Whereas in other projects, we don't see that visibility between uh, labor and tectonic articulation. Now, this year, uh, considering Mises' uh, latest work in America, uh, the 50 by 50 house, Bacardi office building and convention center, there is a repetition, uh, which uh, I would like to here introduce the notion of seriality, as we see here in Eva Hess, uh, the radical conceptual artist uh, in 68, uh, which this buckle of glasses are repeated as a notion of resistance. Uh, and uh, this reality also comes to me lately reading Frederick Jameson's introduction to the, uh, to the book uh, by uh, Sartre, The Critique of Dialectical Reason, especially the 2006, uh, uh, edition, uh, which here the uh, seriality, uh, although each of them, they are different from each other, both in the Hess's uh, uh, sculpture or artwork and Mises project, but nevertheless, they uh, uh, analogically suggest a sense of collectivity. Uh, but seriality also is that, according to Jameson, is the quintessential aspects of capitalist uh, production system, uh, and therefore uh, we, we can claim that uh, Miss by uh, becoming critique uh, didn't see any choice but to accept that seriality but or, uh, uh, articulate its uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, its uh, tectonic aspects. Uh, as such, uh, my second uh, uh, conclusion goes like that. Uh, if one feature of the technification of architecture is the Heideggerian unhandiness of the technical object, another feature relies to the idea of image making that permeates the present culture of capitalism or that spectacle in parametric design. The image precedes the constellation where the past could leap into the present, as Benjamin liked to say, and blast the continuum of the time measured by the honest light of technological maximization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, uh, we have a lot of questions on our uh, YouTube. Uh, but I would like to uh, first ask um, our fellow faculty members whether they have any questions they might want to direct to you. Um, and then I'll, um, I'll grab a few uh, student questions so we can have like a 10 minute discussion maybe. Sure. Anybody from uh, Zoom who joined us um, would like to ask any questions? Uh Thank you. I, yeah, I'd like to ask a question, actually, if I can jump. Sure, absolutely. 
Yeah, thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, so as far as I understand, you you see both Mies and uh, Le Corbusier as uh, maybe icons in uh, creating this technification, this concept, uh, and making it in somehow uh, optic, turning it into an optical subconscious. Am I understanding your point correctly, like as if they are the ones who are producing artwork as an object and reproducing it through photography or maybe other means, but mostly photography, I guess, in the minds of the, or in the optical unconscious of the rest of the world? Yeah, that's a good question. And I forgot maybe to show the this is not going back and forth, I don't know why. Uh, I was going to show this image, uh, uh, which uh, in re response to your question, a comparison between uh, uh, Mises' photo montage, uh, which he learned from Dadaist in Berlin, uh, each, each project uh, museum for a small city uh, or a resource house uh, as a starting point. Uh, and uh, Le Corbusier's use of uh, purist painting uh, in critique of uh, perspectival vision of space, uh, because here, for example, the book you can see from top and front. But their differences to me is that. Uh, about that optical unconscious is that uh, if we borrow the uh, terminology of Gilles Deleuze, uh, territorialization and deterritorialization, and if we consider uh, Renaissance humanism uh, has overshadowed almost Western architecture, uh, then I would suggest uh, their differences about this diachronicism is that Le Corbusier tried to re-territorialize humanism, culture, uh, especially by uh, talking about the surface, uh, which was something Alberti already talks about surface in his 10 books of architecture. But he does that without rejecting technology. So that's why the domino frame becomes a universal issue, which is, uh, as far as modernity goes, as a universal uh, phenomenon. Now, in Miss, uh, he uh, used uh, photo montage uh, following uh, his familiarity with the Dadaist movement uh, in Berlin, but also uh, Russian constructivist like El Lesitsky, all these people who visited Bauhaus uh, when he was uh, in Berlin. So their differences is that, that uh, Miss deterritorialized Renaissance uh, humanism, uh, almost deconstruct, doesn't follow it. Uh, even when he, uh, if we go even with the, uh, that uh, uh, notion of the Hellenic, Tectonic, he even deconstruct that as I try to show uh, in this. Sorry, I stopped showing all these things. Uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, the, but also what is interesting, again, back to the way uh, Le Corbusier was uh, re territorializing. This is a letter uh, he wrote to Madame Meyer, one of uh, his clients in 1925. And we can see in this uh, yellow sheet, he draws a perspective, but also fragments of perspective from different views of the house to suggest uh, uh, what uh, the house is gonna look like. Whereas in this, uh, the only thing he offers are these photo montage things. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other questions from our guest faculty? Otherwise, uh, maybe I can direct a question. Um, 
I'm, um, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a really interesting discussion and great presentation, I think, because it's also retrospective in a way that makes me question the advent of digital architecture. As you mentioned, um, I think what we tend to observe as like organic is more modern than it looks because it's built with maybe more technological tools, paramedic tools and using steel, but still a lot of these buildings actually have orthogonal rooms inside of them. Like if you look at Gary's plans, like uh, Guggenheim Museum, for instance, although the facade is more organic, um, you see that the interior spaces are more orthogonal, which makes me question the distinction between I would say, I mean, the kind of distinction you try to make between technology and vernacular, like vernacular seems to be more organic and technology seems to dictate more orthogonal connections almost. Um, where do you think that the current advent of technology is in, in terms of the post-digital and um, whether like you think um, architecture has some sort of an innate orthogonal um, uh, aim? for space making, like I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what's your take on that? Well, it, here is uh, one of the elegant projects, Zaha did uh, a project, uh, Haydar Aliyev uh, uh, Center. Uh, as you see, what has become important as Kashe talks about digital is a uh, objectile, a surface that run over its frame. Uh, so, in a way, it makes the frame irrelevant. And then that orthogonal also becomes almost irrelevant. As you see here, the frame itself becomes a structural entity. Uh, and then it takes all these shapes, goes. But of course, when you look at some of the details that uh, they sent me all the images of this, is that uh, there is a frame structure inside. Definitely, you know, but the way we look at it, uh, it's totally covered by this uh, surface, you know. So uh, the, the issue is that uh, I think uh, after Le Corbusier in postmodernism and now uh, parametrics, they abuse uh, Le Corbusier's formulation of the free facade because the free facade was articulated based on other four uh, points of architecture, you know, uh, whereas here the surface has become an autonomous entity almost covering the space, you know, even the distinctions uh, like uh, here between uh, wall and roof is just gone, you know, the, uh, so it becomes uh, covering element uh, then uh, which uh, that's most often happens is that uh, one can shape that covering and then uh, think about how to hold it up in a way as far as you think about the structure of that surface itself uh, and uh, that's what uh, most of even in their project in uh, China the Philharmonic or concert hall, there is the images of the structure, uh, but uh, then there is this uh, surface that covers everything. Uh, and after construction, you don't never see that thing, you know. And that's the differences, uh, which to me, uh, here I wanted to show uh, this uh, technological de development from mechanical to digital. We move from early modernist Sakhlika to Noya Sakhlika and now Objecta. And in architecture, then we have Mises uh, kind of rearticulation of classical corpse, rearticulation of Renaissance and postmodernism, which was a kind of kind of re copying or simulation of historical historical form. So my point is that these are the two architects in the entire modern movement that they consider the importance of technology, both uh, in terms of construction, but also in terms of perception. Uh, and they try to 
articulate that. But again, uh, Corp was drawing from aesthetically from aspects of uh, uh, at the beginning Renaissance, and then he goes to vernacular uh, uh, lessons he had learned. Uh, and Miss remained to this tectonic issue, uh, you know, without compromising. And that's why at one point, truly, if you recall uh, uh, some of the architects who did the competition for the Berlin Wall, uh, uh, the, they would put Mises' uh, image on the top of the, their board and they would put the columns as the uh, screws on his face. Uh, so it, it was that or another person, I don't recall the guy, he designed a photo montage that ITT School of Architecture was sunk in, into the ocean like that. But it was a frustration in a way. What to do after this? Thank you. Um, let's. I, I want to ask one, one last question from the audience who have been watching us from YouTube. Um, so I, there, there are a lot of questions there actually, but um, uh, we, we may not have enough time to cover all of them. So I'm going to ask just one of them. Um, so this one goes like this, Re regarding contemporary technology, what tectonic expression represents a potential departure from Mies and Le Corbusier, yet remains resistant to late capitalism and image making? So um, it's a question asked by one of our students. So I'm also, wondering if you see whether there has been a tectonic expression different from your presentation and that has maybe um, stayed res resistant to the late capitalism and image making as well. So apart from these two, do you, are, are there other approaches you consider? I think that's a good question. And that's uh, in a way, a short summary of the crisis of contemporary architecture, uh, uh, where to go and uh, but there is this issue, uh, positive aspects of globalization. Uh, the fact that, uh, and then again, back to this temporality and diachronicism, whereas the West has exhausted uh, their pers enlightenment perspective of history, philosophy, technology. I think it is non-Western countries today uh, like your country, uh, other countries in uh, South America. Uh, China is another good example in a measured way that their aspiration for inevitability of this globalization and modernization, this inevitability introduced two temporalities. One is temporality of their historical development and their tradition. The other thing is this globalization. So this confrontation is not confrontation, it's a paradigm that it suggests that or offers to uh, architects who are conscious about these issues in non-Western countries to articulate work that is quiet more radical and more uh, kind of learning, especially for a student, than what is produced in uh, America or most of Europe today, I would say. Uh, and that's positive point. And uh, one of uh, my favorite things is if you look at Japan, for example, uh, Japan is very interesting country as far as architecture goes. Wherever, whenever West is in crisis, Japanese have an answer. From Kenzo Tange to Ito and all those people, they have a different architecture offering. Kongo Kuma, for example, mm -hmm. right? Do, uh, sorry, sorry to intercept. Do you know the work of Freddy Mamani? I think he's a um, Peruvian architect, self-taught architect. Um, I, I mean, it, it kind of it kind of like highlights the issue you you mentioned because right now they are trying to reinvent their local architecture with technology, 
but they actually use a lot of, there's a lot of use, use of polychromy uh, because it's, uh, they're, they're staying close to their heritage. And I, I would say that's kind of the vernacular impact on their architecture. So they, rather than just um, tra trans, um, like rather than leaving themselves open to the effects of globalization, they try to reinvent their vernacular architecture with technology. I would say that's probably uh, what you also mentioned. Yeah, it's like almost that uh, uh, Maison Jaune. Maison Jaune uses the high, latest technologies of concrete uh, vault system, right? Uh, but then the aesthetic of it uh, is charged with his aspiration uh, and not copying its very articulated way that vernacular comes into uh, that building. And I think uh, that can be done today in non-Western uh, uh, countries. And what is interesting to me, if you have noticed the fifth edition of Kenneth Frampton's uh, Critical History, which I have reviewed, the last part of it, which is the new uh, edition, basically focuses on the work of architects from non-Western countries, uh, uh, from Iran, other places, everywhere, uh, one or two. Uh, from these countries, and that's important. But we can't deny globalization. Uh -huh. All right, thank, thank you so much. This, this was great. We actually exceeded our time, uh, and I think it was really stimulating. It, it also made me wonder a lot about the um, advancements in technology. And um, I guess we, we will end, end the lecture here. So thank, thank you again for joining us and thank you for your lecture. It was a pleasure to have you uh, present your work and research as well. Thank you for having me and all the best. Yes, Goodbye. thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye-bye, take care. Bye.